Now, uh, I want to introduce the theme for tonight. The theme of the event is the last days of dinosaurs. And I think many of you may have noticed in the last weeks and months that there have been a bevy of, of TV documentaries, new book releases, and even a new blockbuster Jurassic World film that's focused on dinosaurs and on the last days of these amazing beasts. And it's features like these that have made us uh, wonder even more deeply about questions that we have about dinosaurs. What were dinosaurs really like as living animals? What was their day-to-day -day life? How did they interact with each other and with other animals and plants in their environments? And then finally, how did such a highly successful group of animals all go extinct, except of course, birds? Well, indeed, many of us here at Burke, uh, the Burke Museum, Vertebrate Paleontology Group, are interested in questions like these. And some of us have focused our research on the end of the Mesozoic era and that pivotal transition from dinosaur dominated terrestrial ecosystems to mammal dominated terrestrial ecosystems of the Cenozoic era that are actually allowing us to get together and discuss all of this today. So I wanted to really take advantage, selfishly take advantage of this online platform that we now have available to invite three speakers instead of just the one that we typically invite to be in person. And all three of them will approach this theme of the last days of dinosaurs, but from very diverse cutting edge perspectives. They're all digging into dinosaur paleobiology beyond what was even imaginable 20 years ago. And they're giving us these fresh insights on the individual lives of these animals, as well as their interactions within their ecosystems as they step toward that infamous mass extinction event at the end of the Mesozoic. So it's gonna be a, an exciting set of speakers and I want to jump right into it and kick things off with our very first speaker who is Dr. Holly Woodward. Holly is an associate professor of anatomy and paleontology at Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences. She uses something called osteohistology, which she'll explain uh, is a microscopic internal look at fossil bones. And we can use osteohistology to tell us about the lives of dinosaurs, their growth rates, their behavior, their physiology, and how that biology factored into their eventual extinction. Holly is famously, uh, one person in the world that has cut up more bones of the two medicine dinosaur, uh, Myasaur peeblosaurum than any other person in the world. But today she is going to share her work on a different dinosaur, the most iconic of dinosaurs. Her talk is entitled, Putting Tyrannosaurus Rex Under the Microscope, What Bone Histology is Revealing About the Tyrant King. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Holly and I'm gonna mute myself and let her take it away. Awesome, thanks so much for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Yep, so T-Rex is probably the most famous of the last of the dinosaurs. Um, as you probably know, it lived about 68 to 66 million years ago. And uh, you probably also know that lots of studies have been done on the dinosaur king, but it's kind of surprising that we don't really know much about its early years. So that's what I want to focus on for the first part of my talk, um, talking about tinier tyrant terrors. So when you think about T-Rex, you normally think of the really big ones. Um, for example, these two guys that have skulls in the four foot to five foot length range. And as we get smaller and smaller in body sizes, we know less and less about Tyrannosaurus rex biology. So we know very little about the juveniles and the baby rexes. And part of this is because smaller skeletons 
are more rare than larger ones in the fossil record. Smaller skeletons don't sink and get buried by sediment as fast. They are more fragile, so they get crushed or scavenged or separated, just beat up, and they're not as apt to fossilize. So although we have a pretty good idea of all kinds of things about the biology of big rexes, we don't know as much about the small ones unless we get lucky and find awesome skeletons. And one such thing has happened in that we have some awesome juvenile skeletons of T-Rex, not as many as I would like, but there's one in particular that's been super useful and informative. And this particular skeleton is nicknamed Jane. Jane is a juvenile T-Rex that is a fairly complete specimen. It has a really nice skull and a skeleton. And to put it in perspective, this is Jane on the left compared to Sue on the right, which is one of the biggest T-Rex skeletons that we know of today. And so you'll see that Jane is about half the body length of Sue. And we can study Jane to answer some of the questions like, um, what can Jane tell us about how it, what it was like to grow up as a T-Rex? What was its biology like? Um, and we can even figure out how old Jane was. So how long did it take for a T-Rex to grow to half the body size of, of something like Sue? And we can do this by using paleohistology. Paleohistology is the study of fossil bone microstructure. So when you take a look at a bone, you normally imagine bones as um, places for muscle attachment. And you know they give your, your body structure. But if you take a cross section of a bone shaft and you look at it microscopically, you'll see all kinds of cool things. You'll see bone cells that actually got stuck in the very bone that they produced. And you'll see blood vessels that carry nutrients to these blood, uh, these bone cells that are just sort of stuck there. And so you realize when you look at bone on the microscopic level that it is a living tissue. And that's why we can use it to learn about how an animal grew. So we can study modern bone and take a look at the microscopic structures. And then we can compare that or, or study the animals that have those microscopic structures and then once we understand how these modern animals live and grow today, if we see those same structures in bones in the fossil record, we can suggest that maybe these extinct animals were growing in similar ways. So we can take a look at fast bone growth. These two images are microscopic views of fast bone or, or bone that's been uh, uh, growing very quickly. And so what you'll see is the bone is this brownish pinkish color. And these long squiggly lines in both of these examples are the blood vessels. And all these tiny little specks are the bone cells. So when you see a lot of bone cells, when they're really dense, that means that the more bone cells you have, the faster you can deposit bone. And the more bone cells you have, the more blood vessels you need to supply nutrients to those bone cells. So these are examples of fast growing bone. And we commonly find or see this fast growing bone in juveniles of large mammals and birds alive today. So slow bone, on the other hand, looks like this. And you can see first off that these big circles here, these are the blood vessels and they're pretty sparse. And these tiny little specks are the bone cells. So they're also pretty scattered and sparse. When you have fewer bone cells, you're not producing bone as quickly and you don't need as many blood vessels to supply those cells. So we typically see slow bone growth throughout life in animals like reptiles, for example, in these alligators. We can also find slow bone growth in birds and mammals today as they reach adult size. So if you think about it, as an animal gets to be adult size, you're already past your growth spurt and your growth is slowing down. So you get slower bone growth. So these two types of tissues can really tell us a lot about the growth and even the maturity stage of animals today and in the past. So back to Jane, we can apply paleohistology to learn about how Jane grew. So I've looked at the histology of Jane's femur and Jane's tibia. So I've taken cross sections of both of these bones 
And this is what the bones look like in cross-section. So the femur was a fragment, but I've got the entire cross-section of the tibia. And in both cases, the bone is this brownish color. And if we zoom in, you can see, again, the bone is brown. All these circles and squiggles that you can see, those are blood vessels and they are everywhere and it's super dense. And the tiny, tiny little specks are the bone cells. So Jane had very dense bone cells and lots of blood vessels, which means that Jane was growing very quickly when it died. Another cool thing about Jane's bones is that Jane has annual lines of arrested growth. So these growth marks are um, formed annually. And we know that because if we take a look at animals today, if the animal takes longer than a year to grow to adult size, annually it pauses its growth. And you can count these growth rings in the bone to age the animal. It's very much like tree rings. So when we count the rings in Jane, we find 13 of these lines of arrested growth. So we know that Jane was at least 13 years old when it died. But at this point, you've got to say, wait a minute, is Jane really a T-Rex? I mean, it's a valid question because if you take a look at Jane compared to the, the skull of an adult T-Rex, I mean, it's so much bigger in the adult T-Rex than Jane. Um, so it's a valid question. Could this be a juvenile T-Rex or could this possibly be an adult of something else? So the question comes down to, was Jane an adult? And bone histology can help us there too. So in the bones of adult animals today, they have a particular tissue on the bone surface. And this is very slow growing tissue. It's called an external fundamental system. And I've bracketed it with these triangles in an alligator on the left and an ostrich on the right. And you can see that there's an abrupt transition from the more rapidly growing bone deeper in and that really slow growing bone on the bone surface. And this is what happens. This is the type of bone that's deposited when an animal reaches adult size. So when we take a look at Jane, we don't see an external fundamental system at the bone surface. The bone deeper in looks just like the bone on the surface. So this means that Jane was still growing when it died. So now we know that this animal, Jane, was about 13 years old when it died. It has well vascularized bone. It has disorganized bone tissue with lots of little bone cells. It has no EFS in its femur or its tibia. And these are all juvenile features of what we see in large mammals and birds today. So the simplest explanation or the most parsimonious is that Jane is a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. So what this tells us is that it took about 13 years for T-Rex to get to half the adult body length. So again, Jane is about half the size of Sue and it took about 13 years to get there. While Sue is again, using histology, we know that Sue is over 25 years old. So that's pretty cool. Super excited that Jane can tell us so much, but it has other things to tell us too. Second part of my presentation is what can histology, particularly in Jane and other T-Rex, Tell us about T-Rex biology. So another cool thing about growth rings or those lines of arrested growth is that the spacing between the lags tells us how much the animal grew from year to year. And so this is an example of lines of arrested growth in a duck-billed dinosaur bone. And this is the typical pattern we see when an animal is younger, the lags are more spaced apart. And as you get older and you get bigger and get to be adult size, growth starts slowing down. You don't grow as much each year. When we take a look at Jane, and I've highlighted the lags in Jane in green, the spacing is kind of all over the place, which means that Jane was growing different amounts in different years. And this is an unusual um, pattern when compared to something like the stuckle dinosaur or even something like mammals today. So this is a T-Rex growth series of chin, chin bones or the, the tibiae. And if you take a look on the left side here, this is where Jane falls out in this growth series. So my question is, is this weird variable growth something that's only happening to the small tyrannosaurs or do we see this in everybody? So I took a look at some older, larger and more adult T-Rex. So here's an example of three of those. And you can see the body size range we're talking about based on the tibia on the right hand side here. So these three specimens of adult T-Rex 
all have this variable lag spacing, the same kind of thing we found in Jane. So this means that throughout life, T-Rex was possibly adjusting its growth from year to year. It wasn't growing much in some years, maybe it was more stressed, it didn't have enough to eat, so it didn't grow as much, but in other years it really put on the pounds. So it's very flexible or plastic in its growth. So what does this mean for T-Rex? Um, it's really cool, but it, what does the pattern mean? Um, we think it might have something to do with niche partitioning. And a niche is something, um, it's like where an animal fits in its ecosystem. What does it eat? Um, what does it do? And so for an example, this is um, a bunch of different dinosaurs representing niche partitioning in the Jurassic and the Morrison Formation. So you had smaller ceratosaurs, larger allosaurs or tovasaurs, and they're all eating different things. They're different sizes. In the Hell Creek Formation, back in the latest Cretaceous when T-Rex lived, there are no mid-sized carnivores. There, there's like this weird gap. So we've got small carnivores and we've got T-Rex and nothing in the middle. And so the question has always been why? So we think this might be an example of ontogenetic niche partitioning. And what I mean by that is we can take a look at alligators and they, they're a great example of this. A baby alligator is gonna eat little bugs and fish and caterpillars. It's gonna get a little bigger and then it's gonna start eating your household pets and some bigger fish. And then a really big alligator can pretty much eat whatever it wants, cows, people, bigger fish. And so the same thing might've been happening with T-Rex. So little T-Rexes were eating bugs and small little rodents. Mid-sized T-Rex like Jane were eating mid-sized dinosaurs. And then an adult T-Rex could eat pretty much whatever it wanted and crush bone, you know, scavenge, whatever it wanted to do. So basically you have these different groupings of, of food or um, items that the animal wanted to eat. And so again, here's that image of niche partitioning in the Jurassic and the Morrison with a whole bunch of different dinosaurs filling these niches. In the Hell Creek Formation, in the latest Cretaceous, T-Rex was filling all of those niches. So really T-Rex only had to compete with itself for food. And again, remember, we know through histology that it took about 25 plus years for T-Rex to get as big as Sue. So it really could take its time and um, you know, monopolize every single body size niche on the way to being an adult, which is just totally amazing to me. Um, so to sort of wrap up what histology can tell us about T-Rex and young T-Rex, um, histology helped us identify not only what a, a juvenile T-Rex looked like, but how old juvenile was. So something half the body length of Sue, like Jane, was 13 years old. Histology shows us that lag spacing is variable in T-Rex, which means its growth trajectory was plastic. It was flexible. It could adjust and adapt. So there is very low mid-sized carnivore diversity when T-Rex was alive. And that's because T-Rex was exploiting all of those ontogenetic niches, um, which is just amazing. That means it was as ferocious when it was young as it was as an adult, which means T-Rex was just an amazing animal. So that is the end of my presentation. And I wanted to thank Dr. Wilson Mantia and the BERT for allowing me to present. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Holly. That was awesome. Um, but I'm not happy to hear that T-Rex was eating mammals. <laughs> Little baby, gotta grow. <laughs> All right. So our next speaker is Dr. David Evans. Dave is the Temerty Chair in Vertebrate Paleontology at the Royal Ontario Museum and a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Toronto. Dave's research focuses on the evolution, ecology, and diversity of dinosaurs and their relationship to environmental changes leading up to the end Cretaceous mass extinction event. Dave is a very famous paleontologist that has discovered more than 10 new dinosaurs, uh, including the wickedly armored Zool named after uh, the Ghostbusters monster. Uh, today, Dave is not going to talk about Zool, but he's going to be talking about a different dinosaur, Centrosaurus apertus, and the medical forensic work or paleopathology that he and his team did to find out how one individual of this dinosaur died in the late Cretaceous. 
His talk is entitled Diagnosing Cancer in a Horned Dinosaur. All right. So for those of you who know um, the research that I do, it's typically focused on dinosaur uh, diversity and paleoecology and is not focused on diagnosing dinosaur diseases. But as a scientist, um, you often get opportunities to do research that's out of your main field of interest through collaborations that's driven by the curiosity of others around you. And that's where the story of diagnosing cancer in a 76 million year old dinosaur uh, begins. Um, it's, an, it's an unusual story for me. And it started with Dr. Mark Crowther. Um, he is the chair of the Faculty of Medicine at McMaster University, which is in Hamilton, Ontario, about an hour or so from Toronto. Um, he is somebody who is <clears throat> not only a medical specialist, he's a hematologist by trade, so, so a doctor that studies blood diseases, um, but he is also a, someone who is interested in a wide variety of different things. And like many scientists, he got his start in science um, loving dinosaurs through dinosaurs. Um, he went the medical path, uh, became chair of the Faculty of Medicine, and he wanted to, to indulge his childhood interest while at the same time celebrating his uh, parents' um, 50th wedding anniversary. So he knew the ROM had a good collection of dinosaurs where I work, and he reached out, uh, gave a philanthropic donation, and, and asked to get a tour of the dinosaur collections um, for, to celebrate their anniversary. And <clears throat> that's where I met Mark on that tour. And we became fast friends. And because of his position as a doctor, he started asking me about uh, what we knew about dinosaur diseases. Um, and I told him what I knew, but that if he had any ideas um, in ways that we could collaborate, I showed him, showed him some of the interesting specimens that we had, uh, which weren't terribly unusual, broken and rehealed bones, for instance, um, and uh, some, some bone infections. Um, but I thought that if, 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 you know, I was open for a collaboration if he was. And so he went away and he started to, to, to think what would be the coolest disease or the most interesting disease that could leave a signature on a dinosaur bone that we might be able to find. And over the course of a year in discussions um, and some research, he noticed that <clears throat> the, that, that cancer, um, a particular type of cancer, bone cancer called osteosarcoma, could leave a trace on a dinosaur bone that we could find. And this is because most cancers are soft tissue, but bone cancer would leave behind a signature in the bone. Um, but that the few records of bone cancer um, uh, were not up to medical snuff. And there was very few cases that um, were really, uh, you know, were convincing. Um, and so he said, well, if we were going to find bone cancer in a dinosaur, where would we go? How do we do it? Um, and I said, well, there's only one place where we could actually go to see a large number of pathological bones that have been curated uh, in a way where we could get through them relatively quickly. Um, and so I reached out to the Royal Terrell Museum. My colleague, Darren Tanky, was part of, part of our team, who over the better part of 30 years since the Royal Terrell Museum in Alberta uh, uh, was founded, um, he was collecting pathological bones that he found in Dinosaur Provincial Park and in other parts of the province uh, and curating them in a large paleopathology collection that, that he, he had built and others had built over the decades. And that collection stood at multiple cabinets, hundreds of bones. And so um, I said, that's the first place to go. And it's probably our best shot. If we don't find it there, um, we just have to come across it by chance somewhere else. Um, so he said, okay, let's arrange a trip and let's go and check it out. And if we don't find cancer in a dinosaur, we might find some other cool diseases. So he brought Snezana Popovich, who is uh, on Mark's left there. And that's Mark's daughter, Rianne, who's also an author on the paper. Um, and Snezana is a human um, bone histologist. 
uh, and she is an expert in bone diseases and their signature histologically in bone. Um, so we did that trip in March 2017. We went through hundreds of, of pathological bones uh, over a couple of days. And there was one bone that Snazana thought was a good candidate um, for bone cancer or osteosarcoma. And that's this bone here. It was originally identified as a broken and rehealed fracture, um, but the shape of uh, what of, of the pathology uh, and how it affected the, the shape of the rest of the bone um, suggested to her that it, it, it was not just simply a, a uh, broken and rehealed bone, which are relatively common in dinosaurs. So the bone itself um, <clears throat> is a fibula of a horned dinosaur called Centrosaurus apertus. Uh, it's about 76 million years old. It was collected from Bone Bed 43 in Dinosaur Provincial Park, Alberta. This is the classic Centrosaurus bone bed that's been worked um, for decades by the Trail Museum. It was collected in 1989. And when it was collected, it was originally noted um, that it had this very odd, malformed, gnarly end to it, not the typically smooth finished end that you would expect. It was only half the size of a normal shin bone, um, but it was thought to be a, a badly broken and rehealed and weathered shin bone. So it went into uh, the collections at the, the Tyrrell Museum and, and stayed there for the, the better part of, of three decades until um, we came along and thought that it might be <clears throat> more than just a broken broken bone. And so once we had a candidate for osteosarcoma, we assembled a large medical team. This was mostly Mark's work. Um, medical team from McMaster and Southern Ontario um, that included a large number of different medical specialists <clears throat> from Snazana uh, to uh, who is a, a, a bone pathologist <clears throat> to medical imaging specialists. Uh, to forensic pathologists, and of course, Mark's specialty in hematology. We got eight medical specialists, as well as my team of uh, um, dinosaur uh, paleobiologists and paleohistologists we brought to bear. And we decided that we would treat this particular bone as we would treat a cancer patient and take the bone through all the steps of diagnosis that uh, that we that would be conducted on a, on a cancer patient to see if we can, could confirm the diagnosis. So cancer itself is a disease that's characterized by the development of abnormal cells that divide uncontrollably and have the ability to infiltrate and destroy normal body tissues. And the cancer that we thought we were dealing with here was an osteosarcoma, which is a type of bone cancer that begins in the cells that form bones. And it is a very aggressive type of cancer um, that characteristically forms malignant bony tumors, not unlike the ones that we see morphologically on the end of this centrosaurus shin bone. So we used a multimodal approach and not only was our wide reaching medical team uh, ap uh, applied to the diagnosis, something unique among these type of paleopathological studies, but we took it from gross anatomy all the way down to, hist uh, to histology. So we, compete we did a multimodal diagnosis um, and we did the stages of um, investigation and diagnosis that, that a human patient would go through. Um, and so the bone itself, you can see from the image here, um, a shin bone should be long and skinny from top to bottom. Um, this particular bone had this almost baseball sized gnarly um, clubbed end to it, which was very unusual. And one of the things that tipped me off to it being more than a fracture callus was that it wasn't just the area of the, the proximal end that had this uh, gnarly outgrowth. The rest of the bone was also affected, which, um, was certainly unusual in cases of broken bone where fracture callus is bone that, that uh, forms rapidly around um, uh, two parts of a broken bone to stabilize it um, 
it is localized rather than reflected uh, downstream of the main injury. Uh, we also got the specimen scanned in several different scanners and analyzed by a medical imaging scientist. Um, our best scans were done at the, the, uh, the University of Texan, Texas uh, fossil CT scanning facility. They produced beautiful images. And then we also <clears throat> basically serial sectioned um, the specimen in our paleohistology lab at the ROM, and we compared it to a normal type Centrosaurus fibula. Um, that had no pathology serially sectioned in the same place. One of the unique aspects to our study um, and that allowed us to really confirm the diagnosis uh, was that we were able to look at the bone microstructure, essentially conduct a biopsy on a 76 million year old dinosaur to look at the um, cellular structure of the fossil. Um, we have a great setup at the ROM for doing this. Um, and the, the histologists, the medical histologists, were just blown away by the detail of the histological data that we could get out of the dinosaur fossil specimens. Um, this is a bone of some uh, of a Centrosaurus individual on the left. Um, and you can see not only the, um, the blood vessels, you can see the lacunae where the osteocytes sat, and you could even see the canaliculi. Um, all in exquisite detail, in fact, much better detail than the modern bone histologists can produce uh, with uh, modern thin sectioning techniques. Um, and this is because basically the dinosaur bones have been naturally stained over millions of years. Um, and so this gave us a really good data set to look at uh, the cellular structure of the tumor. Um, on the right here, you see a normal type of um, of Centrosaurus uh, fibula. You can see it has a dense cortex and a relatively small uh, medullary cavity. Um, and this is the, the, the tumor of the cancerous bone um, in sectioned in exactly the same place. You can see that the, 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 the tumor tissue, the bone, bone cancer tissue is highly disorganized. It doesn't, <clears throat> follow what you would predict of trabeculae or anything like you would see in a, um, in a fracture callus. Um, the normal cortex is, dis is, is highly disrupted. Um, it's a disorganized mess, exactly the type of bone deposition that you would expect in an osteosarcoma tumor. Uh, another compelling um, aspect of this particular specimen with regards to diagnosis is the 3D visualization that we were able to do of the tumor. Um, we took this, the high quality CT scans from Austin and Danielle Defoe, um, who's a renowned paleo artist and works as a research assistant in my lab, um, sectioned the um, abnormal bone or the bone cancer, uh, the cancerous bone in yellow here, um, the normal bone um, is in gray and the normal marrow cavity is in red. Let's see if I can get this video to play for you. Um, here you can see how the tumor and the cancerous bone has progressed proximally to distally uh, from where the tumor started, which was near the knee uh, towards the distal end of the bone. So this is something that you definitely would not expect to see in a, in a fracture callus, which would be just locally deposited bone around the break. And this is exactly what you expect of an advanced cancerous tumor. Given that we worked with, an, with a large group of doctors, uh, we were also able to obtain a, a human um, osteosarcoma um, for comparison. And what's just really remarkable is how similar um, the human case study is to what we find in the dinosaur. So we compared it to a confirmed case of osteosarcoma in a human fibula in the same bone that we had the candidate cancer in a dinosaur. Um, osteosarcoma in humans typically manifests in the fastest growing bones of the skeleton, which are the long bones of the hind limbs typically. In young adults, subadult individuals, we found it in the same bone um, in the same place um, in an animal of approximately the same um, 
uh, ontogenetic or growth stage in the dinosaur. And so um, seeing all of the hallmarks at every level from gross anatomy to um, radi radiography to histology and seeing such a, a, a close comparison to um, a confirmed case in humans allowed us to make a definitive diagnosis of osteosarcoma of bone cancer. And this is the first case of bone cancer um, that's confirmed in a dinosaur. Um, and the first case of cancer um, in the fossil record that's diagnosed to the level that we would expect in a hum human patient. Uh, and the second oldest case of osteosarcoma um, on record. There's a case from a, a, tri a Triassic uh, turtle ancestor that was uh, described a couple of years earlier from our study. So this not only tells us about the evolutionary history and the antiquity of bone cancer, but it also tells us something about the paleobiology of dinosaurs that we didn't know before. Uh, the specimen is from uh, bone bed 43, as I mentioned earlier, or the bone yard. Um, this particular locality was discovered by C.M. Sternberg in 1915. Um, it was collected by the ROM in 1918 and subsequently excavated uh, for decades by the Royal Terrell Museum. Um, this bone bed um, is absolutely massive. It covers an area of at least 1,300 square meters. Only a very small portion of that has been excavated. And from um, the small portion that's been excavated, over 5,000 individual bones have been collected. And 90% of those bones are from uh, Centrosaurus of Perdish of all age classes. Um, if you calculate out the excavated area to the estimated area of the bone bed based on the, based on the density of what's been excavated so far and the aerial extent, um, it's been estimated that this, the, this single site, the single deposit, um, might preserve the remains of over 40,000 individuals of Centrosaurus. That is a lot of individuals of the same species in the same place. Here's some excavations of the, of, of the Tyrrell Museum at about the time when the, the bone was collected. And so bone bed 43 and other bone bed le beds like it um, provide evidence that Centrosaurus lived in large herds like wildebeest or caribou do today. And finding all of those individuals preserved in the same place suggests they all died at the same time and were living together at, at, at the same at the time of death. Um, and this, these bone beds have been interpreted um, by scientists over the decades as a herd uh, being killed in a coastal monsoonal flood. And so what's interesting here is that this individual, this advanced cancer, um, which certainly if allowed to persist, would have killed it, um, did likely did not die from that cancer. It died in this flooding event with a large number of other centrosaurs that were part of the same herd that it lived. And so what does this tell us about dinosaur biology? Well, what's interesting here is you can see that the advanced stage of the cancer in the bone, this individual would have been deeply affected um, and experience severe pain from this advanced cancer. And in fact, it, this cancer is, is so advanced, it likely would have metastasized and started to affect other body systems. It certainly would have made it much easier prey uh, for the large predators of the time, like the Tyrannosaurus, Gorgosaurus, and Despletosaurus that were the apex predators um, in the ecosystem. And so what it suggests um, is that it's the protection of these large herds that allowed the cancer to get to such an advanced state such that it was easy to identify in the fossil record. Surely this individual would have been, been struck down as prey to one of these large tyrannosaurs if it wasn't protected by, um, by its conspecifics um, and, you know, and members of its family and, and extended family in these large herds. It also suggests that these big bone bed deposits may be a good place um, to look for paleopathologies and survey a single population for rare diseases um, in dinosaurs. 
Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, we published our, our results in, the, in, in a top medical journal in the world, the Lancet Oncology, uh, in the history of medicine section. Um, this was totally wild for me. I never would have thought I would have studied dinosaur cancer, let alone publish in one of the world's top, top journals. Um, and there was considerable public interest in this. Um, we were written, written up in the New York Times and, and top dinosaur discoveries of the year uh, because of um, you know, what an unusual discovery it was and how it made us think of, uh, of, of dinosaurs and, and, and cancer differently. Um, this was picked up by the Science Museum UK, uh, in the UK, who have done a very interesting new exhibition that just opened recently called Cancer Rev Revolution, Science, Innovation, and Hope. Uh, and they reached out to me about a year ago asking if they could include um, the dinosaur bone uh, in the exhibition and our research in the exhibition. Um, and I even sent one of the histological slides there. So here is um, a 3D print of the dinosaur bone and one of the original histological slides in this uh, exhibition, the first large scale public exhibition to explore um, the origins and the treatments of, uh, of, of cancer. And so hopefully it gives visitors perspective on just how old um, the disease is um, and, uh, and maybe makes kids think you know, if they if kids get this disease or, or others get cancer, that 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 they're not that that they're not alone. Even dinosaurs could get it too. So, in summary, um, bringing such a large medical team to bear and treating a paleopathology like we would treat a human patient, I think, um, set a new standard in paleopathological research. We diagnose cancer in a dinosaur to the same standard as as we would in a human patient for the first time. Um, we had the first confirmed case of an aggressive cancer uh, in a dinosaur and one of the oldest confirmed cases of this devastating disease on record. Uh, osteosarcoma affects, uh, it typically manifests itself in the fastest growing bones in young humans. And we see this same expression of the disease millions of years ago in a dinosaur, um, you know, suggesting that bone biology is conservative um, across all of, of amniotes. Um, and it brings dinosaurs, I think, to life in a really unique way by showing that they were affected by many of the same diseases that we see in humans and, and other animals today. Uh, and as I said, um, we hope that this model of, of collaboration uh, with large groups of medical experts will help us to uncover a deeper understanding, not only of cancer, but other diseases that affected animals in the past. So. Thanks to Greg and the Burke yeah, for, ha for, uh, for having me here today to talk about this, this, this research. And as I said, I only represent, you know, I'm, I'm a paleontologist and team of a large team of medical um, experts. So I'm doing my best to represent the, uh, the clinical findings here. That's so awesome, Dave. I love, I love that both uh, your approach and Holly's approach is so drilling down in, in such detail into the individual lives of, of dinosaurs and giving us sort of a blow by blow perspective of what happens uh, to them and how they're, how they're living. Uh, so we're going to, we're going to move on to our third speaker now. And, and uh, our third speaker is, is Dr. Peter Rupnerine. And Peter uh, is going to take a very different perspective. Peter is the curator of geology at the California Academy of sciences. And Peter is our only speaker that is not a dinosaur paleontologist. He instead, it, it, his research is transdisciplinary with a focus on understanding the evolution of ecological systems and their complex dynamics in deep time. Uh, and Peter has been really on the leading edge of developing innovative new computational approaches to understanding things like uh, food webs in deep time. So today he's going to share with us his work modeling how rich dinosaur dominated ecosystems of the very last part of the Cretaceous um, responded to the asteroid impact that collided with the earth 66 million years ago. His talk is entitled The Darkest Day, the day the sun set on the dinosaurs. What I'm going to talk to you about today is 
the last days of the dinosaurs and a project that we've been working on to try to reconstruct how the community of the dinosaurs and all of the other animals and plants that formed their ecosystem that they're interacted with may have collapsed at the end of the Mesozoic. So as many, if not all of you are familiar with now, about 66 million years ago, the earth suffered an almost unique uh, catastrophe in the last uh, perhaps half a billion years when a large asteroid about uh, 10 kilometers in diameter collided with the earth and it collided in the region of the Yucatan Peninsula in the Gulf of Mexico. And we've discovered the crater, we've explored the crater and so on. This was a truly tremendous event. It's not exaggerating to say it was earth shattering. Uh, this bolide collided with the earth with enough energy to equal about 19,000 times the total nuclear arsenal of all of the nuclear weaponized countries on the earth today. So truly tremendous event. And as this explosion, this collision unfolded, it caused uh, many changes on number of time scales. Within the first few seconds, of course, it would have been a tremendous amount of energy released. Some of the immediate effects of the impact would have uh, devastated species and caused some species within a wide radius around the impact to become extinct almost immediately. There's the energy from the explosive impact. There's tsunamis, misspelled here, tsunamis that we, we know we have debris from the tsunamis that were caused by the impact, as well as a tremendous amount of debris that would have been thrown out, um, out and up and into the atmosphere and then down again from the explosion. There are also longer term effects that would have unfolded over the next few minutes to the next several years. There's debris that was ejected into the upper atmosphere, debris ranging in size from almost microscopic to uh, pebble sized bits of uh, molten rock thrown into the upper atmosphere, cooling and solidifying because it was melted, raining back down to earth. Um, there's some debate about how hot material was when it reached the surface again, but at least in some cases would have been hot enough to spark wildfires. Whether those wildfires were global or not, we don't really know, but they would have been extensive in some regions. Also a lot of gases liberated from the physical heating reaction of the impact that would have uh, caused uh, noxious, uh, toxic gases within the, within the atmosphere, but also gases uh, such as uh, sulfurous gases thrown into the upper layers that would have caused a couple of effects. One of them would have been global cooling, what we call an impact winter scenario where temperatures would have fallen very dramatically within a matter of days, falling maybe as much as 25 degrees Celsius, a huge change in temperature in uh, many parts of the globe. And then the other one, and the one that I'm going to focus on tonight is that there was enough soot generated from the impact and perhaps from the wildfires later on that they would have obscured the sun, incoming sunlight to the surface of the planet, which essentially shrouded the planet in, in a curtain of darkness and would have caused the sunlight levels to fall so dramatically that photosynthesis, which is a process by which plants are making food from sunlight and water that essentially supplies almost all of the ecosystems on Earth, it would have caused light levels to fall so low that photosynthesis would not have been possible. So in recent uh, modeling by a number of geophysicists and geochemists, done, uh, they've done really detailed models of what this would have looked like, how much soot would have been ejected into the upper atmosphere, what particle size sizes they would have been, and how long it would have taken that suit and debris to begin to settle out of the atmosphere. And the most recent models have suggested that the darkness could have been intense enough to hold photosynthesis for a period of up to two years, uh, perhaps even a bit longer. And during that time, of course, the plants, both because of the cooling and because of the darkness, would have been going into a shutdown mode, some of them definitely 
would have died, um, species would have gone extinct, but many plants, as you know, can actually go into either resting modes or survive as roots and tuber tubers and seed banks. But at any rate, the energy and the engine, if you will, of the ecosystems, the world ecosystems, would have been severely disrupted. So we've been interested in our project and looking at three main questions. First, could the shutdown of the plants because of darkness explain any of the, the extinctions that we've actually documented in the record? Second, if they can explain some of the, the extinctions, what did that ecosystem look like, ecosystem collapse look like? Was it a very sudden event? Was it a very prolonged and dragged out gradual ramping down or winding down of the ecosystem? Or did it perhaps wind down and then crash very suddenly, it hit a, a tipping point? And then when sunlight did return, as that suit was eventually cleared from the atmosphere and the planet enough sunlight was again coming into the planet to support photosynthesis, what did recovery look like? So in order to answer these questions, myself and a large group of highly skilled <laughs> paleontologists working on not only on dinosaurs, but on mammals, um, also relying on paleobotanists that work on the plants, folks that work on insects and aquatic organisms, such as fish and aquatic reptiles and so on, have been studying the Hell Creek Formation uh, that Holly uh, mentioned earlier, the Hell Creek Formation in the Northern United States and its approximate location at the time of the end of the Mesozoic is shown by that little red circle up here on the globe. Oops. On the globe. And here's a photo of the Hell Creek and shown here on the right are two of the iconic dinosaurs from the Hell Creek Formation, Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops. These are specimens in the LA County Museum of Natural History. We've been able to look at, in the fossil record, the final about 300,000 years of the Cretaceous and the abundance of fossils there, that abundance being generated by almost 60 years of uh, intense collecting in that area, including by uh, Greg, Dr. Wilson, himself. And over time, we've accumulated records from not just Hell Creek, but the surrounding regions in Southern Canada, working our way down into Colorado of more than 250 animal species and well over hundred species of plants and trees. And taking that large collection of plant and animal species, we've organized them into what we call a functional network. And if you look at this funny diagram over here on the right, each one of these circles with a number in it is a group of animals or plants that are what we would say are functionally the same in that they perform the same jobs in their ecosystems, they perform the same functions. And in the case of the animals, they also uh, prey, all of the animals in one of these little circles, prey on roughly the same prey species and the plants and animals are preyed upon by roughly the same species. So we group these animals together and all of the lines between these circles indicate predator-prey interactions. And so this is what we call a functional network or a functional view of our ecosystem, telling us or giving us a way to organize our species into what they did and who they did it to and who did what to them. But how can we know what happened during the days and years immediately following the impact? Because remember, according to the geophysical models, we're talking about two years of darkness. And two years is essentially invisible in the fossil record, except in exceptional circumstances, such as the situation that uh, Dave just described, where we might have this uh, very large herd of Ceratopsian dinosaurs that would have died in a catastrophic flood. But in general, we're looking, at least in our case, we're looking at an accumulation of about, you know, uh, maybe 300,000 years. There are very few, if any, fossil remains from that uh, final moment of the dinosaurs and several years after. And notwithstanding recent reports that are really exciting that tell us that maybe we've been discovering specimens from actual the day of the impact, or at least uh, from the time when we were still feeling the physical effects of the impact, but they don't really give us a sufficient view into the ecosystem. 
And so we would like to know, did our species die on the day or did they linger on? And if they did, for how long? Also looking at individual fossils or individual species tell us only part of the ecosystem story. We have to think of the ecosystem as that big network of all of these species all interacting to make something that works. So in order to answer our questions, then we take our fossil record and the way that we've organized the fossil species and we turn to ecology. So studying systems today, what we've learned about how ecosystems function and mathematics because the mathematics is the way that we really capture how those systems function. And then we take those two understandings and we pull them back into the past to try to answer some questions. And one of the things we have to do then is to really understand the species that are occupying our little functional groups here represented by our circles. The way that we do that essentially is to reconstruct a food web of our community where we have the species and we have connections to other species that in, would have a high probability that it was preying on, connecting it to other species who with a high probability would have preyed upon it. And so we get one of these paleo food webs. We reconstruct all of the thousands of interactions in the ecosystem. And once we have a working model, then we turn out the lights. Basically, we simulate what would have happened after the impact of the asteroid. And then we take that working simulation and we observe it for periods of time going up to about 700 days, so almost two years. So here's how we go from on the left, we have that functional food web. And on the right is an example of one of the species level food webs that we can simulate from that. And if you look very carefully, around the edges of the circle, they're tiny circles here. Those are individual species and all of those lines in between are predator prey interactions. An ecosystem or a community is a very busy place. The two colors here show sort of communities, sub-communities that emerged naturally from it, showing animals and plants that either lived and or fed in predominantly either the terrestrial part of our ecosystem or the aquatic part with quite a bit of crossover. So in order to then take that food web and ask our questions that we're interested in, we need to know for these species, who did they eat, who ate them, how large were their populations, because that would tell us, for example, how long a particular species could persist as the ecosystem wound down because population size can be an advantage under those conditions and what was the lifespan of these species. In other words, what was their normal rate of death, normal mortality rate, and how would that have changed in the days of darkness? Fortunately, we have a lot of tools at our disposal today that allow us to do that, both from studying, mainly from studying modern organisms. And so shown in this graph, the graph up here on the top left is one of these uh, curves, for example, where we're looking at a collection, a very large collection of modern uh, mammalian species. And one of the things we know is that for animal species in general, the size of the population declines as the animals get larger. Of course, there are many more rats, for example, than there are mountain lions in, in the area where I live, rats being much smaller. And it does so in a very regular way. And that regular way allows us to do things like Shown here on the right is a paper that came out early last year from some of my friends across the Bay at the University of California, Berkeley, where they estimated the size of the population of Tyrannosaurus rexus at any given time, and then also went on to figure out, to guess, estimate how many T. rexes ever lived. We can also do things like this funny curve plot here in the lower left, where we can know how quickly populations grow based on the temperature ranges that animals prefer to live in. And so we can know uh, what your population size is and how quickly the population grows and many other factors. And then shown in this craziness over here on the left, we can take our food web model and we can add the mathematics to it and we can actually get a, in the computer a living functioning food web, if you will. And we can see the populations grow and 
decline and vary over time in a way that they would have been doing 66 million years ago. And here's what happens then when we turn off the lights for 100 days. On this horizontal axis, we have the days since impact. And so we run the system for a bit, beginning at a day zero, and then the asteroid hits. And I think you can tell where the asteroid hits because the lines are all show the population sizes of all of the species, the more than 300 species in our ecosystem. And they all take a nosedive because of the impact. And they take a nosedive because the plants have suddenly stopped producing food. But then after a period of time, most of them recover. You can see these lines climb back up. And most of them, after 100 days, recover to where they were prior to the impact. But if you look below, down at the bottom, there are a few lines down there. Some of our species, even at 100 days, do become extinct. And also, you can see a few standout lines that recover slowly. Some species recover much more slowly than others. And so we did this, and we did it for periods of 100, 150, 200 days, and so on, all the way up to 700 days. And every time that we did it, we examined how the population declined and populations declined and how many species went extinct. And shown here, for example, in contrast to 100 days, is results for 700 days. Now you can see that big gap. Many species go extinct. The recovery takes much longer. Most of those dramatic recoveries are plants. And even though you can see a lot of species actually recover, the system, the community is now very different. A lot of those species populations are much smaller than they were. And they're much smaller for up to 5,000 days after the impact. So when we take all of our simulations for all the different periods of time, there's a really nifty way that we can summarize it. So I know this is a bit of an odd looking diagram, but bear with me for a moment. Right here at the beginning of this loop is day zero. And what we're looking at is each point, each little symbol is a day after the impact. And that big shift of all of our lines dashing over to the left of the plot is what the communities did when they were hammered by, by the asteroid and then the shutdown of plants. The purple lines show the trajectory, if you will, of the community for 100 days, and it's a loop. And what that tells us is we have this big change in the ecosystem, and then after 100 days, it slowly recovers and recovers back to what it was. For 350 days, that's a blue curve, there is a lot of recovery, it takes a long time, but it never goes back to what it was at the time of impact. The ecosystem has become transformed and the red for 700 days is basically stuck where it was. And we can do this for all of our intervals for 100 all the way to 700 days. And it shows this, this array here tells us that as the length of darkness got longer and longer, the ecosystem at the end of the darkness was more and more different and actually smaller than it was at the day of the impact. And then finally, we also know if we look at the numbers of species that are going extinct for each of our sort of days of, or lengths of impact, we're showing the results of three simulations here. You can see as we go from 100 to 200 to 300 days, more and more species go extinct and never recover. The red line shows the actual level of extinction for our Hell Creek community. And so you can see where those lines cross the red line. It's telling us that based on our simulations by 650 to 700 days, the numbers of species that we predict would have gone extinct is beginning to match what we see in the fossil record. And this is a really nice consistency between the fossil record, what the geophysical models say, should have been about 700 to 750 days of darkness. And what our model is telling us that that would have been enough to explain what we see in the fossil record. So the ecosystem after just 200 days would have been transformed. Even though many species would have recovered, the ecosystem would have been remarkably different already from what we had before the impact. We also know at least 650 dark days were necessary to cause the extinctions that we observe and the 
models tell us that that probably happened. We also know, however, that the Hell Creek ecosystem is really resilient because if you think about it, think about just 100 or 200 days of absolute darkness. That's a tremendous change to the planet. And yet our models tell us that if the impact was smaller and we had 100 or 200 days, we might still have dinosaurs around. But the impact was so overwhelming that it was at least just long enough so that while well, we lost almost all of the dinosaurs with the exception of the birds. So before we draw any firm conclusions from this, however, we're in the process of doing many more simulations. We have to do that to be more certain of what we're doing. And there's one important thing that we haven't accounted for yet, and that's the decline in temperature, because that decline in temperature would most likely have made things even worse than our current modeling pre predicts. And maybe uh, 700 days of darkness would have been way more than would be necessary to cause the extinctions. And so I'd just like to thank uh, Greg and the entire team at the Burke for inviting all of us this evening to speak to you. It's been a lot of fun. I also want to thank, thank uh, this list of names at the top of uh, my screen here, are all of my collaborators and on the right are all of the institutions that we're working together to do this project. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Burke Museum again and to do the land acknowledgement for the California Academy of Sciences that like the Burke, of course, is sitting on land that was once uh, the homelands now occupied, homelands of indigenous peoples of North America. Thank you. That's so cool, Peter. Uh, I've seen some of that before, but to see it all together is really amazing. And for those uh, young listeners out there, um, math matters, right? That, that's uh, fantastic stuff that you showed and how paleontology and ecology and mathematical modeling can all kind of come together to recreate what might have happened uh, 66 million years ago. Really, really cool. Uh, I am so honored to have had uh, these three amazing talks. It's really been fantastic for me as a, as a viewer and listener and someone interested in this time period. And I have um, loads of questions, but I think uh, I want to remind you all um, to enter your questions. And you can, you can go to that Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and put in your question or upvote any questions that you would like to hear answered from our guest speakers. And we'll get started with them right away if you guys are ready. Are, are, are the three of you ready? Okay. Oh no, the number one question is from our very own UW alum, Dave Damar. <laughs> Dave asks, can histology be used to test the hypothesis that there are three species of Tyrannosaurus, specifically T. rex, T. regina, and T. imperator? Holly, I think this is right up your alley. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, histology can be used to test that hypothesis. What we need is a puppy. It, what we need is uh, more samples of T-Rex. Um, we really need to have a nice growth series and many specimens at each of those growth stages so that we can see, you know, if there are different trends in growth curves. So we can see if these trends are falling out into three different groups, for example. Um, and I'm sure Dave could add to this a little bit um, histologically or anything else. Yeah, it takes a big sample to see to see what the differences are in, in growth. I agree full on. It'd be interesting to see if the robust morphs have a different growth growth curve than the grass owl ones. So just for context, um, Dave, can you explain this this hypothesis? And 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 I think this was earlier this year, right? It was proposed. Yeah, there was a group of scientists that included Greg Paul and Scott. Got persons who propose that the group of specimens that we've traditionally referred to as Tyrannosaurus rex actually re represented three different species. Um, and there was one species that occurred in the Lower Hell Creek, and I can't remember which one that is, a robust morph. And then there was a, um, uh, in, the, in the, the later sediments, there was two species that seemed to have, to have co-occurred. 
which included sure. T-Rex. Yeah, so we, we need to try to find out what Tufts love our T-Rex is. Soon, soon, we'll try to do that. Um, okay, next, next question uh, with 10 upvotes uh, from Persephone. Have there been any diseases or viruses seen in dinosaur fossils that we were unable to identify with a modern counterpart? That is a really good question. And because in the study of diseases, the present is, is really key to the past, um, I'm unaware of any examples of diseases that are unique, unique to the unique to the fossil fossil record. So good question, but um, we really use our knowledge of modern diseases and how they affect bones, particularly to interpret what we're seeing in the fossils. Cool. Okay. Um, and then a question about birds. Why did birds survive when all other dinosaurs didn't? And this is from anonymous attendee. Does anyone want to take that one? I'll take a quick stab. Sure. Um, well, one of the things that we know as we've been going through all of our simulation results is that uh, smaller animals in general uh, persisted longer. So if they're going extinct in our simula simulations, they do so later than, than larger animals, of course, which were at that time were dominated by the dinosaurs. And so it's possible that it's not necessarily just being a bird, but a small size um, might, have, might have been a factor. Also being highly mobile may have been a factor also, not in terms of escaping the effects of the impact, but being, being able to uh, maybe uh, range very widely, widely in short periods of time to scavenge and uh, search for any food that might have been available. Yeah, that sounds uh, reasonable. Um, it certainly applies to things like mammals as well. Um, here's another question. Uh, this is from Teddy, who I think is five years old. He wants to know how paleohistology might change depending on whether a dinosaur is a carnivore versus an herbivore. Pretty good question for a five-year-old. Paleohistology can change in a few ways. One, um, one way that I've noticed, and this is, you know, there are exceptions, but it seems that herbivorous dinosaurs tend to have a more fixed growth trajectory. So they tend to grow more predictably. When they're younger, they grow faster. And when they get older, they start slowing down. Whereas a lot of the theropods, meat-eating dinosaurs, seem to be more flexible in their growth from year to year. So they have more what we call plasticity in their growth um, overall and in, in general. Um, so those are two examples that I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah, I think we could see that in that slide that you showed of the Tyrannosaurus rex with variable um, size uh, lags there, right? Mm -hmm. or, or spacing. Yeah. Um, OK, here's a question. Other than plants, what animal species bounce back the quickest after the massive impact? Well, I think that's a two-part answer. I can tell you what our simulations say, and then Greg Kapal probably tell you a bit about what we actually see in, in the fossil record. And in the simulations, the things that bounce back the fastest are the insects. Um, insects follow very quickly after, yeah. after the plants. And the, um, you know, we, we, as I said, we have to run many more of these simulations, but uh, small mammals seem to be, uh, some of them do go extinct, some of the mammals do become extinct, but in terms of recovery, uh, things like mammal and few aquatic species of fish that are surviving uh, do so next. But the insects pretty much come roaring back as, as quickly as they can after uh, the plants. Yeah, I I, uh, I would agree with you that there's there's some a lot of variability in how things recover, and that's one of the uh, sort of next research frontiers that we're looking at is trying to understand the second half of that story, the extinction, and then the recovery. Okay, we're going to ask one more question, and uh, and then we will I think have to have Gabby come on and, and close us off. So here's the last question. Uh, and, and 
Let's see. This is from Laura. She asks, what is the biggest T-Rex found and how big is it? Everyone wants to know that question. What is it? Um, so there are a few contenders. Um, there's a really big skull at the Museum of the Rockies. There's Sue, of course, which is like the complete dinosaur. And then there's a new one called Scotty that's come on onto the scene um, more recently that claims to be bigger than Sue. And I think Sue's topping out at 40 feet in length. Um, uh, so Scotty is supposed to be a bit bigger than that. Um, but, you know, there could be more robust, bigger T-Rex that lived, but just didn't fossilize or we haven't found them yet. And, and would that correspond to being a much older T-Rex? It seems that um, the bigger the T-Rex, the more robust and burly and just beefy it looks and stocky. If you take a look at Sue, it's just that the bones are just very thick. The skull is very massive. Um, so there's going to be an upper limit, and I would imagine that Scotty and Sue are probably approaching that upper limit um, because you will have some variation about the mean, but that's probably getting there. And, and that is about how old, just to put a guess out there. Um, Sue's been aged at over 25, um, closer to 30, I think now with the reanalysis, um, but that doesn't mean that you know, T-Rex killed over and died at 30. It could have lived longer than that. All right, that's awesome. Um, okay, Gabby, I think you're gonna shoo us away, aren't you? I am, and it's just, this is the hardest part and the most horrible job, I have to say, because uh, Holly, Dave, Peter, your presentations were absolutely amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us tonight. Greg, you're an amazing moderator, so thank you. And I wanna say thank you again to our donors and uh, our two donors that help us sponsor this event tonight, Nathan uh, Mirbold and Rosemary Havranek. So thank you so much for making this program uh, possible. And I also wanna thank everybody that participated. At some point we had up to like 234, 234 participants. So that is awesome. incredible. Yeah. So please come to visit us at the Berg. Uh, if you're local, please stop by anytime. You might be able to see the, uh, Greg roaming <laughs> the halls. So stop by. And if you're coming for a visit, please, 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 please uh, stop and say hello to us. But uh, we thank you again. Uh, we hope you have a wonderful evening and we'll see you soon.